So I'll start off then with just a little overview for those of us that aren't quite as immersed in this every day. Um, so the Delaware w River Watershed Initiative, or DRWI, is a large-scale initiative funded by the William Penn Foundation um, whose overall goal is to protect and restore local water quality as well as ecological health within the Delaware River watershed. Um, they've kind of gone about this by trying to align conservation efforts and do that in ecologically significant areas that are under threat. Um, and to use science to sort of accelerate science-driven conservation. So really integrating the science in with the conservation activities on the ground to get sort of the best benefit from both. Um, Delaware River Watershed, I think most of you are likely familiar with that. Um, DRWI is a huge initiative. It has over 50 NGOs um, working in partnership to implement collective projects that look at restoring degraded areas, protecting critical landscapes, um, and measuring water quality as well as ecosystem health, both to inform what we do and to learn from what we're doing. Um, William Penn, again, is the main funder, and then a whole host, and this sort of can scroll forever um, all through all those various um, partners that we're working with. And there's been over $80 million um, committed to date on this project. So it's a pretty significant one. Um, and, well, we'll get into that. Synthesizing based on my data, evaluating what works, and adapting is sort of our main goal in this. So the basic premise of DRWI, they started off with sort of where should we work within the basin? We can't put our money everywhere. Um, so there was an initial sort of science screen of areas that would be good to work in. Um, that then got coupled with a feasibility screen, so where can we work, not just scientifically where might we want to, but where's the most ability to find capacity and opportunities to work, where can our impact or investment have a large impact, and where can we measure that impact. Um, that led to the design where there's, um, I'm blanking, eight <laughs> clusters. <laughs> um, eight clusters, so the work is focused in only about a quarter of the basin. Um, we then implemented um, the various projects, have been monitoring those, and we've just finished, well, a year ago finished our first three-year phase of this and have started sort of adapting, four-year, right, it got extended into four years, um, started adapting, sort of learning what we could, and then we've essentially going back through this cycle again. So, and then the idea will be there is will be a third and maybe even I heard mentioned a fourth phase, so we'll see how long this goes but trying to learn from, from what we're doing. So in this sort of phase two, so the first of this adaptive um, cycles, we sort of added another goal to the project, which was focusing in and saying, we really wanna work in areas where we have a high likelihood of achieving measurable and meaningful change. And we'll get back to a little bit why that sort of is an important statement. So where are we working? So this is a map of the eight clusters. So all the work that we do and all the funding is concentrated in these areas. They represent about a quarter of the basin. Um, they're all ecologically significant and what's nice is they sort of stretch the, the gradient from urban to ag to pristine landscape. So we have the areas around Philadelphia, for example, all the way up to the Poconos, Brandywine Christina being one of our heavier ag areas. Um, and so they sort of are a nice, um, subset of all the different landscapes that we see within the basin. Within that, um, within each of these colored clusters, we also picked what we're calling focus areas. So not just we're gonna work in this general region, but for each phase, exactly where in a smaller area are we gonna work? Um, and those were selected by the cluster partners based on sort of opportunity and the likelihood of measurable impact. In phase one, this was moderately successful in some areas and less so in others. Um, I'll call out John, sort of the Brandywine Christina cluster had some really lovely um, sort of watershed based focus areas and others were a little more geographically or sort of politically opportunistically um, drawn. And so one of the big changes that's happened whoops, between phase one and two is we went back and re-looked at those focus areas and said if we want this measurable impact, if our goal is that measurable and meaningful change, um, we need to do a little bit better job focusing what we do into watersheds. If our impact is spread across multiple watersheds, then it's harder to measure. Um, and so, for example, in one of our clusters, these shaded areas were the, were the focus areas in phase one. Um, you can see not totally watershed driven. Um, and these are the focus areas from phase two. So much more conforming to watersheds so that when we work, that, uh, that impact of what we're doing is focused in on a single stream and that we can potentially measure that impact. Where we are on the map? 
where we are Long. now, ooh. Primarily French Creek. Somewhere, French ah, yeah, so if I go back, oh. so this is, okay. so Redding is right in the. Yeah, that's the okay. Schuylkill River. Yeah, that was the Schuylkill Island cluster. Yeah, that's so that's the Schuylkill Creek, running right through. Right there, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so it's not that change elsewhere isn't important, just if we want to try and measure that change so we can learn from it, we need to sort of concentrate our efforts um, in certain areas and particularly within watersheds. Um, the other sort of objective we had to do is we had to pick certain targeted stressors. We can't work on everything. Um, and so back in the very beginning, before the whole project even got started, um, the stressors that were decided on were agricultural runoff, stormwater runoff, and forest fragmentation or loss of um, headwater forest areas. Also somewhat on aquifer depletion, but that's sort of limited to southern Jersey and the Kirkwood Cohansey area. Um, so if we have these stressors we're interested in, we also have to worry about, well, how can we accurately p assess what pollutant loads, what these nutrient and sediment loads are in streams, and the quality of the resources that are sort of protecting or producing that clean water. Um, and so to do that on a basin scale, we develop com something called the Stream Reach Assessment Tool. Um, and this is an online, free to use, anyone can log in. I didn't pull up the website, but we can at the end if we want. Um, tool to try and model and estimate loads from the watershed and the effect then on in-stream concentrations. So it integrates a whole number of data sets, map sheds, NHD+, um, land cover, NLCD, point sources from wastewater um, treatment plants and other permitted dischargers. And what it's nice, or what's particularly interesting about it, is it takes data that usually when you get models like this, they're done at the HUC-12 level. So for example, in the Delaware River watershed, there's 426 HUC-12s. And we have downscaled, or sort of, yeah, downscaled that model to be able to work at the NHD plus catchment, which is then there's only f over 15,000 of those. So it's getting the data at the scale that we're working at, because before these models that have been run previously are just too large scale. They're difficult to inform sort of on the ground activities. Um, and so it's doing this by relocating essentially the loads at the larger scale to smaller scales based on land use. Um, and then, yeah, models at that reach scale, so that, you know, kilometer or so, mile, so reach scale, what's the mean annual load of t uh, total nitrogen, total phosphorus, and total suspended solids, um, and what are the respective in-stream concentrations of those. It also has a score um, for the, each watershed that sort of aggregates local landscape features that we know promote clean water. Um, and it has an interactive web interface. So anyone can go on and look at it. So when you zoom in, if you were to go online, this is sort of our header page. Um, and if you zoom in on any particular area, you'll see something like this. So this is the Brandywine Christina area and our nitrogen tab. And you can see the streams are all color coded by concentration, the watersheds by loading. So already you can sort of see, ah, green with our legend, which I don't think I put on here. Um, those are areas that don't have a whole lot of loading. Um, you can see the point sources are all these black dots. You can click on all of this and get more information. So for example, if I clicked on the Buck Run upper watershed, tell me something about the size, the loading, the population within there, sort of facts about that watershed. So at that local scale, what does the science tell us? Same thing for phosphorus. Um, and this is this score looking at things like riparian cover, erosion potential, et cetera. So then looking forward with this challenge of high likelihood of achieving measurable and meaningful change, okay, so we know what we're starting at. The problem is what is me measurable and meaningful change in a scientific sort of sense? Um, so it's, is it just, you know, seems to be doing well or can we actually quantify that? So at the Academy, we took this approach, it's certainly not the only approach, but that's the one we took to try and quantify what is a measurable change and what is meaningful. Well, meaningful, we can look to various, you know, the EPA, some of the, the state DEPs, to look for thresholds that they have for what they consider to be a sort of a good, a fair, a poor, nitrogen, phosphorus, et cetera, level. So those are sort of our meaningful, maybe, thresholds. Measurable was a little more challenging, and so what we basically did is we looked across all the long-term data that we had and found that there's a correlation between the concentration at a site, so the average sort of concentration at any site over time, and the standard deviation of the data. So how noisy is that data? How much do concentrations vary? Um, and we said, well, basically, if we to truly think we've seen a change, and it's not just 
coincidence because we're only sampling four times a year and sort of where exactly we sample, to try and quantify that noise, we said essentially for a change to be meaningful, it needs to exceed that standard deviation, essentially exceed that noise within the signal before we're sure that we've really created a change. Um, and then what you can do is you can sort of loop this back to, well, what do we have to do to create that change, either measurable or to hit some threshold? Um, and so with models, we can say, well, for every acre of restored land within a watershed, we, there's estimates for what impact that has on water quality. So great, we can say for any given starting watershed concentration of, say, nitrogen, as you start restoring or putting restoration activities on the land, you should be following some trajectory. Um, and what would it be if they're using urban BMPs, ag BMPs, and ag and urban, for example? Um, and when, how long is it going to be before you hit that measurable threshold, that fair to poor various quality thresholds? Um, and then the idea is to not just do this for any sort of, or some selection of sites, but rather to put this, like SRAT, on some wide basin scale interactive tool. Um, what this meant, oof, that's hard to see, what this looks like in practicality, this is um, an example from one of our sites. This is nitrogen and phosphorus over time, so that's about three and a half, four and a half years of data, concentration here versus time. And the dots, also purple, it's a little easier to see, the dots are the actual data. The dash line is the running average over for the year, which you can see sort of varies. Some years are high, some years are low, based on when we sampled, which is only four times a year. Um, and the shaded area is that one standard deviation. So basically, you want to see our data consistently start to exceed, hopefully below, that one standard deviation sort of characterization of the noise. Um, and so it's a good way to let people see with their own data in a stream, how, how are they doing? How is that trajectory? Um, and how close are we to exceeding sort of what we think is just noise versus truly a change, a measurable change as we've defined it? Um, and so this is being done um, at the basin scale. So how do we accurately predict for any watershed this impact of conservation activities? and put that into an interactive decision-making tool where we basically piggybacked on that SRAP model. Um, so we put in a couple of changes. For example, the acres of BMPs um, needed to achieve <coughs> measurable change or these various thresholds. Um, and this is an example, when you zoom in, this is still that upper Brandywine Christina area. Now um, you have streams that are color-coded, for example, here. Um, it's the number of acres that would need to be preserved in the watershed to not hit more than 5% impervious surface. We've basically measured, um, so for example, just like SRAD, any stream on here, you can click on it, and now you get some of those restoration stats. For example, how many acres of the watershed, so in this case, 38% of the watershed, we'd have to, or 30% of the acreage on the watershed would need to have BMPs added or implemented on it to achieve a measurable change in nitrogen. Okay, there's a lot of assumptions that go into this, the efficiency of BMPs, the starting concentrations, et cetera. But it allows our cluster partners to not have us say, oh, you should work here, but rather, here's your watershed, here's all that data, where do you think you should work? Where can your work have the most impact? Um, or what size watershed you need to be working in in order to have that measurable impact? Can you afford to put 38% of the watershed, to implement BMPs on 38% of the watershed or not? Do you need to work smaller or larger in scale? How do you get 153%? That's in the sense you can't. There is not enough acres to restore at, I think this is a 40% efficiency. It's not possible. The water should simply, yeah, has too many nutrients. But yeah. You're not, you're not sampling all. The no, so this is all model based. It is, I mean, the model is validated on um, USGS long term data, but no, this is simply a model right now. Yeah. Um, but it does lead into sort of, yeah, we are collecting data and hopefully refining this over time as we get information. Um, so yeah, and then we've done the same thing for protection areas as well. We've said, like the example is on there, how, um, how much land would have to be preserved to maintain less than 5% impervious surfaces or to hit thresholds, for example, like 70% protection across the whole watershed, across just the first order watersheds, just of your riparian areas, things like that, looking at the land use now and trying to think forward, how much, act, how much would you have to do on the ground to achieve various thresholds? And of course, those thresholds can be defined um, by the cluster groups as well. Okay, so switching over, so 
main title, um, looking also about what we do to measure that impact. So I mentioned we have all these models where we're also measuring um, in streams the water quality, the biological integrity, and trying to see, well, what is the, the change we've observed, not just modeled and predicted, but actually observed over time, and how can that help inform <coughs> what we're doing? Um, and so some of our overarching sort of objectives when we're monitoring is to understand things, for example, like how does water quality and the structure of ecosystems respond to these on the ground conservation activities? Um, also, what biological indicators um, or water quality metrics both best respond to both the stressors, but also the alleviation of those stressors on the, the aquatic ecosystems? And how can monitoring therefore help inform our future work and our partners' work? Um, so what we're sort of going about with our monitoring is first we want to build up and we've been building up a baseline level of data on both water quality and ecosystem integrity across the basin um, and to integrate this into informing on the ground efforts um, and planning. So how does nutrient reduction link to stream ecological integrity? What is the response of a stream to a single versus multiple BMPs? Things like that. Um, so we've been monitoring a couple different scales. We've got sort of at the cluster scale, so sort of within one of these colored areas, um, we have a couple of 35 key sites. We have focus areas, which we're just defining now, but are going to be a little smaller watersheds, and then even potentially project implementation or project monitoring as well. Um, biological indicators, macroinvertebrates, fish and algae. We do habitat um, and chemistry as well, and depending on the types of site at different frequencies. Um, so in the interest, I'll skip through this pretty quickly in the interest of time for water quality, um, one of our big goals in that baseline data is looking at large scale patterns and trying to understand across the watershed. So for example, we see really clear regional patterns in major water quality parameters. And this is a complicated chemistry graph I won't explain other than to say the colors represent our different clusters. And we can see, ah, and where they fall in this graph, which is different areas of chemistry. For example, this is the calcium carbonate sort of space. All of our little yellow Schuylkill Highland sites, not surprisingly, <coughs> a lot of limestone fall in that area. So we see sort of regional patterns in the sense that you see clustering of different colors throughout this graph. Um, so related to things like geology, whereas there's limestone. Also due to landscape activities. For example, we see a really clear sea salt signal, or what I normally think of as a sea salt signal, in our Pocono sites. It's a road salt impact. The dominant chemistry of those sites is very much being influenced by landscape activities, including road salt application. You said um, this was in the Poconos? And the po our Poconos cluster, yeah. Oh, I would have thought it was in the urban areas of that more. Well, we see that. Salt. We do. We see it there. But interestingly, our brown urban sites, we see this magnesium chloride. And that's the pellet salt. So it's the difference between rock salt in some clusters and pellet mm -hmm. salt in another. So you see, yeah, so at large sort of big scale patterns, we of course see seasonal patterns. For example, this is chloride, um, much high, the highest in all of our urban sites and very much higher in winter. Again, not surprisingly with a road salt source coming in. Um, we're also looking to establish large scale controls on all the chemistry we see, particular nutrients. So I pulled a few nitrogen examples. So for example, we can see the concentration of nitrogen in our sites is heavily correlated to percent agricultural land use. The more agricultural land use we see, the more nitrogen we see in our streams. Not surprising. Um, but if we look at how that nitrogen varies over time, so this is variance over time of nitrogen relative to land use, you see actually that our ag sites start to have very low variance, which is interesting. And that's basically indicating those landscapes are saturated with nitrogen. There's so much nitrogen out there. No matter what you do on the landscape, no matter what the hydrology is doing, nitrate always comes out. Interestingly, we don't see patterns like this in total phosphorus or TSS, indicating that these are much less correlated to land use. So when we're thinking about what are their controls and what can we do to influence those parameters, we have to look to something more than just land use um, as well. And then for that, <laughs> a little bit late, well, I'll hand it over to Steph for some of the biology and one of our other big next steps that we're working on. So I uh, work on the biological indicators a little bit more. Um, as Marie said, um, we're doing water quality or water chemistry habitat and the biological indicators because uh, the biological indicators might be a little more stable in their response uh, and they also incorporate those changes over the longer periods, which you probably already know. Um, and so uh, she made this nice graph to look at um, total nitrogen 
um, here, and the macroinvertebrate Pennsylvania DEP index of biological integrity score, which they developed to look at are streams attaining their designated use and what's their overall quality based on certain metrics that describe the macroinvertebrate community. Uh, and macroinvertebrates are insects and snails and worms um, that are living in streams. So um, it's not a perfect relationship, it never is, because you've got these insects and the fish and the diatoms are all responding to multiple stressors in the watershed and um, they're responding in different ways, but you can at least see that um, some of those are, you can see the better IBI scores in the higher end here, um, where there's low concentrations of total nitrogen and then in general um, a decline. And a lot of our sites are in the fair area and even up in the Poconos, ooh, <laughs> I don't know what that right. one does. All right, I was hoping for a pointer, oh, there we are. Even these that are up in the upper watershed, a lot of them are not in the excellent or great categories. Uh, because in the DRWI, we didn't target the perfect areas where no work was needed or l a little work wouldn't result in a change. And so we also avoided those really terrible areas where, really yeah, um, Camden, uh, <laughs> places like that where there's got to be a lot more funding than in the DRWI is available. Um, so, so we see that some sites are in the good area, but most of them are actually falling in this fair area with just a few in the poor area, which is encouraging because then there is opportunity for those on the border of poor to jump up to fair and those in fair to move up closer and closer to good as people do more work. So here um, is just a map of the existing um, scores for percent the sensitive taxa, the mayflies, stoneflies, and the caddisflies. Um, orange is poor, purple is good, and or purple is fair, and green is good. And so um, here we just show what the baseline data say. And so we'd like to see a metric like the sensitive taxa go up a level, or at least go up a percentage to get closer to that next level up of quality. Um, and this is a figure from, we've got down at a table, uh, this report that we did um, in early 2016 based on the data from 2013 to 2015, um, just telling about what we're doing together, um, what the indicators mean, maybe some specific fish and macroinvertebrates, um, what the baseline uh, quality ratings are with the different indicators and um, and some graphs of just the data and we are happy to share the data uh, with anybody who's interested obviously our geographies are centered around DRWI activities but if you are working nearby or you just want to know you know do you have any data on Skipback Creek do you have any on Valley Creek um, you know we can at least tell you yes or no and and send that to you um, is this data all on the Wiki watershed, uh, which is uh, not yet. Really well, known. the Academy and Stroud work together. That is Stroud's platform, but the um, I'll talk to you in a minute about our dashboard where we we are putting the data on for people to use. It is all going see. publicly onto HydroShare, which is a sort of more of an academic platform, but it's all going to be there eventually. And downloadable by anybody who yeah, wants to get it. Yeah. Um, so we're just working the data from different angles to look at what are species that indicate change. As communities, you know, it's called meta-community where we have this group of macroinvertebrates here, but we'd like to see this group. So how can we identify which bugs and diatoms and fishes that we would like to see um, if there's improvement and looking for uh, where those change points might be and also thinking about, we call it structure when you say who's where, but the function is, um, you know, who is processing algae, who is collecting detritus, who is, um, what are the functions of these creatures in the stream, and how can we talk about changes for, in terms of existing function of stream processes and an improved function, and what's that going to look like? Um, and we're working on a paper. Uh, on that right now. Let's see. Um, 
And so just another reason we work on the biota is that when you think about agriculture, you've got all the things that it's changing in the stream. So water chemistry and nutrients and temperature are all important, but you can really tie it all back to the living creatures in the stream um, and talk and then you sort of back uh, relate who is there and the functions they're providing and the conditions in the stream. Um, and so we talked about, use, like the title of our talk is sort of how we're using these data. So this is one um, handout that we brought and I'm happy to, if we run out, uh, share with people. I also just have a little list here if you'd like some more of our products. Um, we can email and mail them afterwards. Um, where we took our samples, which are the circles that are pretty, and then the Pennsylvania DEP's data, which are the triangles, again with those poor, fair, and good color coding across each cluster to say these are the baseline data. Um, I think it's good to note that different indicators are showing different stressors and different responses to those stressors, which is why we're doing multiple indicators because sometimes you have agreement that here the bugs are good and the diatoms are um, good, but other places this is actually just next door, you have you know, fair bugs and poor diatoms. So that can tell you that the habitat may be good, but the nutrients are pretty high. Um, so that we can help target stressors and messaging. And so you can go to a landowner and say, you, know, you don't need anybody to add boulders here, but you know, if you work to bring your nutrient levels down, then we could show improvement in the algae that are really good indicators of um, nutrient pollution. Um, so what we're doing now is working on more of these to focus in on smaller geographies because none of you work on this geography. You, well, many you might, but it, when you want to be talking to somebody, if you bring this rabbit-shaped picture to them, they're like, I don't care. Um, <laughs> but if you're coming over here, um, then we could zoom in here and say, okay, here's your quality. You could show improvement. Your stream could look like this one that looks good. Here's what you have in terms of fish and a score for your stream, and here's what they have. And, and, and talk to the landowners about you know, what they can do, what they can have an impact with their activities. Um, and so you're the ones who, well, the practitioners are the ones who have the messaging to say what you want people to do and why. And then we can provide you these data with explanations of, um, you've got a lot of black-nosed dace. They're really good at well-oxygenated, you know, high-oxygen streams with good habitat, but also they can tolerate a lot of pollution. Do you want to be able to stock trout? Um, do you want to be able to sustain trout year-long? Well, if you and your neighbors do these activities, perhaps we could bring those back. Um, so we're working to get the practitioners more fluent with talking about data, using data in their messages to landowners. And so for that, we're really working with people one-on-one -on -one because this, you know, just looks like a big messy mess if you put this in front of a landowner. And even some of our practitioners are like, what is going on here? And so is each dot a point where you go and sample four times a year? Is that the protocol? Um, some of them we sample chemistry four times a year and then um, macroinvertebrates, diatoms, and fish we do once a year but it depends. We don't get to every site every year because we have over 300 sites. Well is that where your volunteers come in? Because I'm on one group and we go out and sample stuff and send you, you know, yeah. bottles. That's it, yeah, Mike Bullard sends them. Yeah, I get those bottles. Yeah, <laughs> you get them. And, uh, <laughs> when they're water, when there's water inside. So those, like, that, these are the volunteers that go in there. A, a lot of them are, yeah, yeah. not okay. all of them. Um, it, it's good. We have a mixture of volunteer and Academy and Stroud scientists going out to them. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's part of our getting the data back out there. Um, and just to look for the scores for the macroinvertebrates um, and as Marie was showing those you know cloudy error bars around. So here are four creeks in the middle Schuylkill um, licking their two sites on Maiden Creek and a site on Saucony and this is showing in for the a different IBI um, the fair and the good thresholds. So for these four years that we've sampled at these sites 
they can change dramatically and that is normal you know um, we've got different amounts of rain and dryness uh, things are going on from one year to the next that cause these to be different um, and even you know bridging between fair and good so this again is where we have to think about how much is this changing from year to year and then decide how much change would show an improvement and just keeping in mind that um, in general here is for diversity and percent sensitive taxa at the same streams um, different metrics of the function and the diversity and the overall score will show different patterns at every site based on what's going on in their watersheds so in phase one we had three to four years of sampling and that's what we really need to just get that baseline variation um, and then their response could take a long time um, three to twenty years depending on how much work is being done in each watershed and how much that is um, able to affect the streams as Marie noted you know we've got these legacy nutrients in the groundwater and the soil um, so we can't expect change overnight um, but what we would like to see so I just um, we've run analyses of of all of our sites and looking along all of the values we've got um, which sites are you know in that poor category which sites are in fair and which are good what do these values look like in those different areas and how much improvement do we think we could see based on the work in the DRWI so in this next slide I'm just showing um, uh, yeah what we would like to see uh, because when we started this I think we were hoping agricultural BMPs as you know have been implemented since the 80s so we we're like great so many people have studied this that we can say look at all these streams that have recovered since the 80s but the truth is a lot of times funders say we want you to put your money in the on the ground work we don't really want to pay people to be taking samples for something that might or might not change um, so we are doing a lot of this work which is good and important and so from our data set <coughs> Here, you know, I'd like to see diversity go up by half a point. Um, so that would take this blue line up to here. And this yellow line, you know, might move up in this way. And so if that occurs, we could say, oh, well, there's still a lot of variety, but it looks a lot better from the activities. And for the same, for these sensitive taxa, you know, here they go from about 15% up to 50%. And that's a lot of variation, but still, maybe that could be just increasing from 40 to 70 percent which would be a great increase in stream function and whereas this yellow one which is way down here under 10 percent we'd love to see it up to 40 for those pollution sensitive techs so come on Saucony um, uh, so that's our approach is to say we don't know how it's going to recover but from our data it looks like they could recover to this extent um, yeah and then we did this for the macroinvertebrate for certain things and for the chemistry. Go ahead. So a question, have we already, in agriculture, if you talk big ag, we do no-till plowing, precision agriculture, have we gotten all the low-hanging fruit? What else can they do to make things better? Um, um, well, I think riparian buffer is always... Are the biggest? Yeah, and, and there are lots of studies showing one is from uh, John's group at Stroud and Burn Sweeney just showing how much of an impact a buffer can have if it's wide enough and then there's still work being showing that even more narrow ones can have some there's still within agri BMPs and agri agri agriculture to make an impact or yeah not, we pretty much like i said got all the low hanging no, i mean i think the dr that i've shown close to the low hanging really yeah. there's so much there's so this is just from the analysis we ran on our data to see which metrics of macroinvertebrate communities do we think could change um, and how much could they change by and we don't know if they can go up a quality rating but just seeing more of the good things um, we think we should encourage you know people to see as a good sign that we're in the right direction um, and again that really depends on on the ground are they doing enough work um, we see a lot of times these are incentive programs and the practitioner says you know I just want to get you to sign on for something but if 
and I think um, Stroud and other groups are really encouraging to say, no, don't just tell the landowner what you'll take. Tell them like all the things they can do to really make that difference and, and push them for more. For chemistry, we didn't set, right now we didn't set we did. how, how much we want to see them change by a percentage. Instead, we set those limits um, that regulatory you know, analyses and policies show are suitable for aquatic life use. Um, so below so four. We didn't set anything. Well, no, we, we are proposing these to be used as targets okay. by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And then they can choose to accept these the or not. Partners choose which goals they want to obtain. Mm -hmm. Based on their projects. Is that sediment? Is that like a median, monthly median, or what? Um, I think that that's for a single uh, measurement, but of but course we'd so, look yeah. over the long it would term. Be a base Oh, so that's that soluble reactive phosphorus. Um, right. So the most biologically available form of phosphorus. Yeah. Of those three chemical parameters, is there one that would have the most significant uh, chance of improving the maximum vertebrate numbers compared to the other two? I think we've seen nitrate is the really. Yeah, and most of our TSS levels are pretty low. There are I, some places where they're really high. Nitrate. No? no? I mean, we don't because have... Because there's no mechanism of connection of nitrate to insects. Nitrate isn't the limiting factor. Nitrate is, is a mirror of agricultural intensity. It's the amount of fertilization. Phosphate gets tied up in the sediments in the field and in the stream, and there it's, or it's harder to tell. But the stressor, if of those three, and those are not the three most important stressors, they're just the three that are most commonly regulated, it'd be phosphorus which is why the wastewater treatment plants are all over phosphorus. Well, but in our yeah. sites, we're not at the wastewater treatment plants as no, much. I know, but that's, so that's for just our, cause and effect. Yeah, for our data, they seem to be responding better to nitrate. You can't directly, people have tried. Correlation, that's my point. I think nitrate correlates most closely to agricultural intensity. Yeah. Which, yeah. Correlates, yeah. which correlates to the intensity of ag, but it doesn't correlate to cost. There's no mechanism of translating <coughs> nitrate into bug impairment. Right. Yeah. It's just a, yeah. They're not it's not toxic. I could I could right. put the bugs their whole life in four milligrams per liter of nitrate and they wouldn't they wouldn't even blink. Well it's not toxic but it, you know, leads to this eutrophication loop which leads to declines in oxygen. So but not without phosphorus. Nitrate's not right, but the we're USGS has been telling us that phosphorus is limiting. Yeah, so that's why because years. we have it's it's phosphorus causes the algal blooms. We got bugaloes of nitrate. You add any phosphorus, you you get algal blooms. Mechanistically, that, yeah, but our nitrate to IBI or other metric scores is always the strongest correlation. Right, correlation is not causation, sure, but run the but it is in with intensity of A. Just use land cover. No, but we have we I know have done. I mean, yeah, you'll see that they lie right on top of sure. each other. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, you can see it's. It's an, that's why we're measuring more than one thing and not hanging our hats on a single one and, and falling back on the biota because the chemistry is only as strong as we can make it and, and assess those changes. Um, so what kills the bugs? It's not nitrogen. What? Oxygen? It's, it's the mystery question. Nobody's fixed an ag stream, so we don't know. <laughs> yeah, and but even in the paper, yeah, even in the paper, well, we've got I, two I minutes. Know, I, Sorry, I, but I, didn't, I, I didn't change oh, nitrate, shoot. I got the cows out of the stream. Yeah. I'm sorry, in two minutes, I totally forgot there's a whole section. Um, That's well, well I'm just going to quickly tell you, to, mo to track the projects, to track responses of the streams, um, the Academy is working closely with other folks in Chesapeake Commons to build something called the Dashboard. And so we've got all these Ag BMPs going on, but we really need to have up-to-date data, have it all centralized, and, and be able to track it. So what happens is groups come in, and every group only has access to the part of the project that relates to their work on the fine scale. And then if you step back on a larger scale, um, it's really limited access so that landowners' identities are protected, and the groups can really work on where they are. So they come in, they create a project, then they go in, enter information, enter the metrics like acres of uh, 
ooh, irrigation, precision irrigation, or number of trees, or number of stream miles with a riparian buffer. Um, and then they can go in here. So here's just an example project where they put in this on the ground, and it looks like this now. Um, so they go in and they draw this polygon and they say, this is where I planted trees. This is where I took the cows out of the stream. So we're getting really nitty gritty detail down. And so they can track their work and then later they can relate it to the water quality and they can say, with your funding, we did this much work on the ground. Uh, so that's the gist of the dashboard. And then the funders and everybody can look at the whole tally of it and say, this is how much work was done. Sorry. Your goals, this is how close you got to me. So integrating the, on, the literal on the ground with the data. Yeah. Um, so that, and then, so, so it's so integrated yeah. with Wiki um, watersheds and integrated with the sensors, and, and the monitoring data are coming into it. Okay, so that's <laughs> <laughs> But it was nice to have the discussion during yeah, yeah, yeah. the talk. <laughs>